Good morning, everyone. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, as we gather on this first day of the week to celebrate his glorious resurrection. I must tell you that this service live is being recorded on a phone, and the sound may not be as good as it normally is. You're invited, if that is the case, to watch it again this afternoon on the church website. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. from Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, 
who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up and out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a cow. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw that, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought our sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to rebel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a cow and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. How you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised. I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read together the song found in your food. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can declare the mighty acts of the Lord or show the Lord all his prayers? Happy are those who act with justice and all who do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have had your people, and visit me with your saving help, that I may see the prosperity of your elect and be glad for the gladness of your people, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned as our forebears did. We have done wrong and dealt wickedly. Israel made a molten path before it, and worshipped the molten image. And so they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that feed on grass. They forgot God their Savior, but in other great things in Egypt, Wonderful deeds in the land of Ham, and fearful things in the Red Sea. So he would have destroyed them, but now that which is his chosen stood before him in the reach, to turn away his wrath from the sea of second reading is from Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way with my beloved. I urge you, Doya, and I urge Synthesis to be the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel 
together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing these things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed these murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. 
Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so that wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. I want to take one line from the Gospel that you have just heard as a text, and it is this one. Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? Now over the years, as I have read this gospel many times, it's one of the parables of the kingdom, as they're called, in which Jesus describes the nature and character and features of God's kingdom, I have been puzzled by this last little piece. I've always thought of this poor man who, after all, wasn't expecting to be at the wedding to begin with, who was compelled to come in because the slaves had gone out into the streets to collect anybody they could find and bring them into the feast in place of those who had been invited and for one reason or another refused to come. This poor man finds himself in the wedding without a wedding garment and he's condemned to outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not really very fair. I mean, the, the man didn't expect to be invited in the first place. And when he got there, why on earth would anybody expect him to have taken the time to go and buy a wedding garment? It's almost like he didn't have time to put on his best suit or his wedding gear. Well, quite recently, a fellow member of the clergy who had researched this in the original scriptures, the Greek scriptures, and looked into the customs of the people of Israel at the time of Jesus, described the situation thus said actually when people were invited to a wedding they were given a wedding garment as they came in it wasn't that they were expected to have dressed up ahead of time there was a special garment a robe that everyone was given when they came to the wedding to wear during the wedding feast so this man had obviously refused to put on the wedding garment that had been offered to him as he arrived, and this was why he was being condemned. Now it puts a little bit of a different face on it somehow that doesn't seem to be quite so unjust, because the man was given a chance to wear a wedding garment. It was offered to him as he came in, but he didn't wear it. So let's look at this now as a story in which there are two different circumstances under which people do not get to be a part of the kingdom. In other words, where they have been invited to the wedding feast or have been found themselves at the wedding feast and are not qualified. First of all, there are the people who have actually been invited, which if you think of it in terms of the mission of Jesus to his own people, they refused. They refused his invitation to become members of the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps they didn't quite understand the way in which he described it, but they rejected him. 
And not only that, but over generations prior to his coming, they had rejected the prophets, they had rejected the various people who had been sent from God with the invitation to become part of God's kingdom. So they weren't there. They had rejected the invitation. Then we have this second situation in which we have people who are there, but this person who refuses to wear the garment that is provided for a person who is there. And here, the situation changes somewhat. It's a situation in which you're there, but you're not ready, and God is willing and offering a means by which you can be ready by symbolically providing a garment that would make you qualified, that would make you able to be a part of the feast of the kingdom. Puts a somewhat different complexion on it. Two kinds of people. Those who are invited, who refuse to come, and there are those, this one person and perhaps others, who have been brought in from amongst the population in general and who refuse the offer of being dressed appropriately or prepared for the feast once they get there. Now I've recently been reading a book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a very strange book in many ways because it's based on a sort of a mythological uh, account of people finding themselves in heaven and being given the opportunity either to stay or not stay. And the essential message of it is that the only basis on which you can be a part of God's kingdom is by surrendering the life that you thought you could run on your own. In other words, if you thought you had everything under control on your own terms, you were not doing it according to God's will. Because the only way that we can live the life that God gave us and intended us to live is on God's terms. So our invitation to be a part of the kingdom is one of the ways in which God invites us to put away the kind of life that we think we can run on our own and on our own terms and accept the life that he is offering to us. And as is the case with the people in the parable, numerous people have all kinds of excuses for why they do not want to turn away from the life they're living and the way in which they're living it and live it according to God's will and purpose. And then finally, there's this one alternative that those who have been brought in involuntarily, just simply brought in no matter what, who are prepared once they get there by being dressed in a wedding robe, this one person refuses even to accept the grace of God that allows him to be a part of the kingdom. So we can reject the invitation by choosing to live our lives on our own terms and not on God's terms, or we can accept the invitation and then refuse the grace of God that allows us to be present and to enjoy and to be fulfilled in God's kingdom. So the question then becomes, what is the basis on which we change from living our lives on our own terms and become people living our lives on God's terms? Very simple, really. Jesus put it very concisely when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That is God's way. If you're not living your life that way, you're not living it God's way. You're living it some other way. You're living it on your own terms. You're living it selfishly. You're living it regardless of other people's needs. You're living it in denial of the people around you. What Jesus is calling us to is a radical 
commitment to the will of God. And in the simple phrase, loving your neighbor as yourself, all of that is included. It isn't simply being kind to people, it isn't simply being nice to people, it is actually being empathetic, it is being open, it is being accepting, it is being loving towards all of God's fellow creatures, no matter what, unconditionally. That is God's way. It is radical and it is vastly different from the way in which our society operates and from the way in which most of us, most of the time, tend to live our lives. That's the difference. If you're invited into the kingdom, if you're invited to the wedding feast, it involves leaving behind the things that were preoccupying you and that you thought were important in your life. And it also involves being willing to be clothed with the garment of God's love and grace as a means of being a part of that feast. That's finally, for me at least, the way I understand this very beautiful and very illustrative parable about the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let us now say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, friends, neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the precious, and the need. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Robert, Don, and Paul, our bishops. And for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Barb, Lisa, Mark, Lindy, Rick, 
Jeff, Cheryl, Ben, Evelyn, Stan, Martha, Gina, Lynn, Dana, Peggy, Karen, Chris, Sheila, those affected by the wildfires, those affected by the coronavirus, and those on the Redeemer prayer list, and those we name either aloud or silently. And we pray for all who are suffering in the isolation of this pandemic, those whose families are not near, those who live alone, those who live with depression or anxiety, those who are experiencing a crisis of their faith, those who are experiencing grief of any kind, that they may find comfort, healing, and peace from your indwelling spirit. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We give you thanks for those celebrating the anniversary of their birth, remembering especially Alice Stolemeyer, Sam Coombs, Eddie Bird, and those celebrating the anniversary of their marriage, remembering especially Jim and Danelle Borland, Jack and Lisa Kearney, and Cedric and Sherry Salisbury. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, remembering especially Sheila Combs, sister of Cindy Coker, and Milan Peters, father-in-law of Ed and Ann Goff's daughter, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We put their trust in you. O oh God, for as much as without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace. Just very brief announcements. First of all, I just want to say again that I'm delighted to be with you this Sunday. My name is John Bolton. I'm the diocesan canon for pastoral care, and I'm here because your rector is at the moment dealing with some family issues and needed some time away, and I'm glad to be able to give him that opportunity by taking his place this morning. It's been a joy to with you, be with you this last Sunday and again today, and I hope that you were able to hear me okay over the broadcast system, and I look forward to a time when we can be more closely in contact with each other. I bring you greetings from your bishop, who, as always, maintains you in his prayers and in his thoughts, as he does the other 114 congregations in our diocese. Any other announcements that might be relevant, you can find on the parish website. And I look forward to this time going forward as we try to find better and better ways of worshiping God in the midst of this pandemic. God's blessing be with you all. Amen. Let us together give thanks to God by saying the general thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessings of family and friends, and for the love and care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, 
for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him at all times and in all places, we give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and those whom you love this day and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.